So suppose we want to solve a problem and we already know an algorithm for that problem. How hard is it to translate that algorithm into code? What I'm showing you here is a, an indicative diagram. I don't have actual data to plot and show you, but I hope this gives you a sense of what has happened over the last roughly 80 years. This diagram is showing you two things. Firstly, the number of programmers shown in this orange line is growing rapidly. And the second thing, the difficulty of coding, the difficulty of taking an algorithm and translating it into code is decreasing rapidly. And there are some interesting points along this journey which I want to draw your attention to. So back when digital computers first started, programming was really, really difficult. This line starts off very, very high. And the number of programmers was very small. And just to give you a sense of why this was the case, back at that time, if you wanted to program, you had to express your ideas in machine language, the only language that a digital computer truly understands. This language looks like a sequence of zeros and ones. And as you can imagine, it is very, very difficult to think of ideas in terms of raw zeros and ones. This is why this was an extremely difficult task back at that time. But then in around 1947, the same time as we got independence, assemblers came along. Assemblers took advantage of computers that were a little bit more powerful than the earlier computers and they could invest some of that power in allowing programmers to express their ideas in something that looked a little bit like words. These are specialized instructions. Now this particular example is from a more modern form of assembly language. But as you can see, there is something that is readable here. It turns out this is some kind of an instruction that moves a value. Now this is not very easy to understand, but I hope you agree it's much easier to understand than raw zeros and ones. Assemblers took these kinds of uh, instructions that are a little bit easier to understand and translated those into raw assembly. This meant that programmers no longer had to think at the level of raw zeros and ones. They could raise their level of understanding to something that was a little bit easier to understand. And because of this, the number of programmers in the world increased by a small but significant number. Then in about the early 1950s came new advances. Computers by this stage had got even more powerful than they were a few years earlier. And with that newer power, designers started imagining simpler ways for programmers to express their ideas. So starting from about 1950 up to the present era, there has been a long trend towards making high level languages and taking compilers and interpreters, specialized software that could translate those high level uh, ex expressions into assembly and then of course that goes into machine language just like before. In addition to these high level languages that allowed us to write statements like this with meaningful names rather than hard to read symbols like this, it made it much easier for programmers to express their ideas. Furthermore, programmers started having access to tools, IDEs or integrated development environments that made this code easier to read. For example, by color coding special terms, we call this syntax highlighting, and this made it much easier. Modern IDEs have syntax highlighting as well as a whole host of other features that make the task for programmers much easier. So over this period, programming became easier. The number of programmers increased significantly. In the modern era, 
the generative AI era, again, we see a step change. The promise of generative AI is that you don't have to write your answer in high level code. You can instead express your ideas in natural language. In this case, I'm showing you an example of what is called a comment in Python. We start a comment with this special hash symbol and then we write something in natural language. When we press enter in our IDE, the generative AI jumps in. My cursor is right here blinking and my generative AI is jumping in with a suggestion. It is suggesting that the way we write the Python code for this natural language statement is like so. And if we accept this, we can then follow the same trajectory as before. We can use, in this case, the Python interpreter to convert this into assembly and then the assembler will run the, convert this into machine language and that is what will eventually run on my uh, computer. So this is the promise that uh, generative AI has. We can now express our ideas in natural language and suddenly this means that a whole bunch of other people who found it difficult to think in terms of code can now translate their ideas into code. Many of you will now call yourself programmers because of generative AI and this trend towards increasing the number of programmers is something that has been going on in the last eight years and generative AI has only accelerated it. Now there is a major major difference between generative AI and these earlier technologies that I have indicated. You see, all these translations from code to assembly to machine language are handled by software that is rule-based. We can check that all those rules are working correctly, that our compiler or, uh, or interpreter is working properly, that our assembler is generating exactly the right machine instructions that it's supposed to, to, supposed to do. In contrast, generative AI can hallucinate, which means that when it makes a suggestion like this, that might be correct. In many cases, it is correct, but we don't have the same level of certainty that we did with the other levels of translation earlier in our history. So, this is why when we use generative AI, it is extremely important for us as humans to learn how to critique the code that AI is producing. We must learn how to stare at it carefully and say, are we sure that this is correct? Of course, in this example, it's very clear that answer is equal to 42 is probably the right way of saying uh, this intention. But if this code is more complicated, this can be a very challenging task. To help us make sure that the code is correct, we will often write test cases. So we will test if our AI generated code works, at least in some cases where we know what the right answer is. So these are skills that we must develop now that we're talking about generative AI. Once again, let's make sure we understand uh, these ideas. I want you to think about each of these statements and then let's discuss.